So uh, we move to the next speaker, our pediatric radiologist, Maria Sellers. She will speak about uh, cavity a bit above that compartment that we were discussing the most. So we are moving to the thorax and speaking about the lung assessment of those contrast enhanced ultrasound examinations. Please. Uh, good afternoon and um, thank you very much for inviting me to um, talk very briefly um, as there's not really much on COS of um, uh, pediatric lungs. So really the objectives of this, uh, the next 15 minutes or so will be to discuss both intravenous and intracavitatory use of ultrasound contrast agents in the context of lung and pleural disease um, in pediatric practice. And I'll also review a couple of examples of um, uh, pediatric pleural pathology, which we investigated with, um, with contrast enhanced ultrasound. Um, we often get you asked this question, uh, particularly in dealing with children, um, when it comes to the intravenous use of pediat in pediatrics, what are the uh, contrast agent doses we would use? And we don't move any, any further away from what we usually use in children if we were looking at the liver um, or kidneys, etc. It's exactly the same intravascular dose, so 0.6 mils for children under the age of six years. This is just roughly speaking, 1.2 for children between the ages of six and 12, and 2.4 mls for children over the age of 12. So very much more like the adult dose in the slightly older children. Um, as is any um, uh, application for intravenous use, it's administered uh, via a 20 gauge cannula in the anticubital fossa and then um, flushed with a 10 mil um, normal saline. So I'm going to show you a couple of cases where we used um, contrast enhanced ultrasound, both intravenous and intercavitary, to one, solve the problems as to what was actually going on in the chest, and sometimes also to um, uh, aid the clinicians in terms of, of further management for this particular group of children. Um, everyone at the moment is, is, is trying to manage certainly pediatric uh, uh, patients uh, far quicker than we used to be, far more efficient and try and get to a diagnosis quicker, treat them sooner and get them out of hospital um, earlier. So this was a, a two-year-old child who presented with a week's history of um, cough and fever. And you can see on the chest X-ray uh, in the bottom left-hand corner, it clearly is an abnormality in the left lung. You've got very large air fluid levels, um, areas of consolidation. And the question always is, um, is this a cavitating pneumonia? Um, is this a lung abscess or is this empyema? And sometimes your grayscale imaging, which we always will do, doesn't necessarily give you much of a clue as to what you're dealing with. And you can see the, the middle and on your right hand screen, you've just got this um, heterogeneous appearing, uh, septated um, uh, appearance to this left lung with air, with air within it. Again, that could be coming within the pleural space or the lung and put color Doppler on, it doesn't really add any further um, towards uh, your diagnosis. So you administer um, an IV injection of, of Sonovu, which clearly delineates, um, and you can see on the video, your more superficial lying um, uh, empyema, and deep to that, your necrotic lung, your, your, your necrotic um, necrotizing pneumonia, whether it's vascular, you've got vascularity running through that. Uh, this particular child, in actual fact, we did the contrast ultrasound after the CT, which you can see in your bottom right-hand corner, which again didn't really add very much. You've got very thick-walled rind, enhancing um, uh, air-containing spaces, and difficult to differentiate on the CT, which was um, empyema and which was necrotic lung. And in fact, this was one of the first cases where we decided to use IB um, Sonovu in order to differentiate between what was um, uh, lung pathology and what was pleural pathology. You certainly don't want to go st um, sticking drains into a necrotizing pneumonia. Um, you run the risk of therefore developing a lot further down the line, things like bronchopleural fistulae. Um, so this was the first case where we used to help the diet from a diagnostic um, perspective in what was going on. 
Um, this is another example. Again, a uh, child with a on the chest X-ray, you can see clear opacification throughout that left lung. The mediastinum is slightly shifted to the right hand side. So is this all pleural fluid? Is this all empyema? Um, or what's going on in the underlying lung? And you can see following administration of IV contrast very beautifully um, outlined. You have your um, ne necrotic lung, uh, collapsed lung, and the, the surrounding um, pleural fluid, surrounding empyema, which on your grayscale imaging, it's, it's difficult to differentiate whether this is all fluid or not. And this aided the clinicians in being able to um, uh, pass a drain into that and the child was therefore um, sent home sooner following um, drainage of the empyema and IV um, antibiotics. Um, this is another example of a necrotizing pneumonia, very similar case, but again on the opposite side. But you've got mediastinum being shifted towards that right-hand side. So in other words, is this just all um, uh, necrotic uh, collapsed atelectatic lung? How much fluid is there surrounding this lung? And again, the bottom left picture, you can see we administered IV contrast, showing this collapsed lung with surrounding um, empyema and quite a substantial amount of fluid. So even though there was significant empyema on the chest X-ray, that mediastinum wasn't shifted because of the underlying atelectasis, the underlying necrotic lung. And you can see in the bottom left picture, there is in fact an area of breakdown of the um, um, the, the visceral pleura, and this child, in fact, developed a bronchopleural fistula. So it can also preempt the possible complications that might arise where you've got a breach uh, in the lining of the lung as a result of the extent of this severe necrotizing pneumonia. This was a two-year-old uh, child who was referred from another hospital with uh, cough and high temperature demonstrating on the chest x-ray, clearly a necrotizing pneumonia with a pacification through much of the left lung and a left-sided effusion, but again, difficult to differentiate clearly what's pleural fluid and what's lung. Um, the ultrasound grayscale imaging did show a multi-septated um, effusion on that side. So a chest drain was put in, so she had a pigtail catheter um, inserted and the effusion was effectively drained. But three days later, she was apyrexial. Uh, there was no output from the drain, um, despite installation of urokinase. Um, and you can see on the grayscale imaging, the difficulty with assessing how much of this is lung, how much of this is underlying um, uh, empyema uh, with a child with a chest drain in situ that is now no longer draining, and the risk, therefore, is do you take the drain out, preemptively take the drain out too early, and the child then reaccumulates fluid again. So IV contrast was administered, not through the drain, but intravenously. And what you can see is that although that lung is densely necrotic, you've got black areas, you have got a pacification of lung, of lung parenchyma all the way out to the periphery of the lung. And therefore, we were quite happy to tell them that this was just necrotic lung, there was no underlying um, effusion, despite them instilling neurokinase, and the drain in fact was not draining because there was nothing left to drain, and they could happily take the drain out, and a couple of days later the chest x-ray bottom right demonstrated a normal, um, well opacified, well um, inflated, um, treated lung with residual change in the left lower lobe and certainly no empyema on that left hand side. So transcatheter contrast enhanced ultrasound, how do we do it and when do we do it? Well, as you heard from my colleague Dr. Huang in terms of intercavitatory use, it's no different from what you would do visualizing uh, um, a cavity within the abdomen. You um, insert a single drop of Sonovue, um, diluted in a syringe, either 20 or 50 mils of 0.9% saline, depending on the size of the child. You obviously don't want to inject too much in a small infant uh, or a small child, but in a more adult-sized child, you would use a 50 mil syringe. And you're looking at the evaluation of intrathoracic collections. What can you tell the clinicians? Well, you can give them an idea of, the one, the position of the catheter and a catheter that's potentially no longer draining. You can tell them what the patency of that catheter is. Is it an actual fact still patent or is it become blocked and clogged uh, with septations or um, 
a thick um, uh, pus that has been drained from the, from the pleural space. Uh, you can give them quantitative information on the volume of fluid that has effectively been drained and also possible communication of the collection with surrounding structures, fistulas, etc. As Dr. Huang showed you, the application that we'd use uh, within the abdomen. So this was a four-year-old boy who presented with a week of cough and, and high fever. The chest x-ray showed consolidation uh, in the right middle and right lower lobes with a large paraneumonic effusion. Um, ultrasound scan also showed consolidation within the lung uh, and an empyema and a chest drain was then inserted um, following um, ultrasound guidance and you can see the chest x-ray you have a pigtail catheter very neatly coiled uh, in the middle of that pleural space on the right hand side. Three days later however this child became more tachypneic uh, there was further reduced air entry on the right lung and a repeat chest x-ray in actual fact showed a worsening picture. There's further opacification, you still have that chest drain in situ, and there's some mediastinal shift uh, on the other side. Um, and what we did was we gave him an intravenous injection of contrast first to show how, how much of that um, lung was still collapsed underneath and how much of that pleural space in actual fact contained fluid because you're not going to get with IV administration, you're not going to get a pacification of any structures sitting uh, within the pleural space, clearly seen on this right hand diagram, there still was a significant effusion despite the presence of the drain. What we then did was we administered um, a contrast um, down the um, uh, catheter and um, sorry, I'm, this, as you can see on the video clip, what we showed in actual fact was that the catheter was now lying within a single small locule within this multi-septated empyema, and that's what was all that was being drained. So the, there was still a lot of surrounding uh, pleural space that contained fluid that needed draining. Um, the child would then received uh, some urokinase down that drain port and a couple of days later, we went back and re-scanned him. And you could see now that the septations on that bottom middle picture, the extent of the um, pleural space that was now being drained following uh, treatment with urokinase and the septations having broken down. And the child then had effective uh, treatment of that empyema. This was a two-year-old boy with pneumonia, again complicated by empyema. He had a chest drain in situ. You can see uh, the first image on your left. That was an intravenous um, uh, injection showing collapsed lung uh, and a large empyema. With a drain in situ, we were able to show them, as you can see on the right-hand picture, that although the drain was very slow to drain, it was effectively positioned following um, intra-cavitatory um, um, uh, injection of contrast down the chest drain, we were filling that space. So in fact, they just needed to be patient um, and wait. Um, and once intravenous antibiotics had took hold um, and there was further breakdown of that um, empyema, the drain then started to drain effectively. And in fact, sometimes we find that even by us flushing, effectively flushing that drain with a little bit of contrast, we just, we, we basically clear the drain of any material that may be blocked and all of a sudden you suddenly get this gush back um, of, um, of uh, pus. So in fact, the use of intercavitatory um, contrast can sometimes not only be um, uh, diagnostic, but also in some ways therapeutic as well. Um, just briefly, our experience, uh, we published uh, um, this um, um, paper looking at a population series of 10 children suffering from um, pneumonia, and we looked at initial evaluation with chest x-ray, grayscale ultrasound, and the final outcome uh, with follow-up. And really, the examples that I've shown you uh, were, are all in this paper. That was our experience with intravenous and intercavitatory use. Uh, of the evaluation and management of, of complex pediatric pneumonia. Not your uncomplicated, but complex pediatric pneumonia. Our results certainly show that um, intercavitatory contrast and hot ultrasound can identify where the catheter is lying, confirm that it's in the right place, um, and detect any loculations which may be hindering um, uh, drainage. 
um, intravenous uh, contrast can establish the diagnosis of a necrotizing pneumonia, which is sometimes difficult to differentiate between grayscale, on grayscale between lung that is uh, necrotic and a complex uh, empyema. And also um, intravenous contrast enhanced ultrasound guided management by, by indicating the need for chest catheter insertion or preventing unnecessary catheter insertion or in fact um, early catheter removal. Um, so establishing appropriate timing uh, for removal of the catheter. Um, and finally, I'd like to invite you all to London um, to, to come and watch us in action uh, if, if you are not yet using this application with your pediatric population. Um, certainly these are some of the sites you might see if you choose to come and, to come and visit us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria, for a very nice and I think uh, the talk that might bring us a bit more forward, not only in pediatrics, but maybe in adults as well. What is, uh, again, the question about uh, how long does this contrast stays in that pleural space? How much time you have to watch its inaction? Is it the same as the other cavities or in a thorax it has a different it's very similar to the other cavities. It stays around for a long time. But what we have found is, in actual fact, you need very tiny volumes. Um, and you get your answer very quickly because you're basically, it's, it's real time. You're injecting at the same time that you're imaging. So once you've injected, sometimes as little as four or five ml of, don't forget, this is one drop of Sonovue within five mils of saline. So your volume of, of Sonovue is, is is really tiny. You've used a 20 or 50 mil syringe. So in, in actual fact, the concentration of Sonovue, you can, you can get an answer very, very quickly within, within children. Um, so even though we say we use a 20 mil or 50 mil syringe, we certainly don't inject that volume of contrast um, while, we, while we are doing the investigation. May I ask you about the impairment of the image by that air? that might appear in empyema or uh, also drained uh, pleural spaces, those bubbles that are already there, that air, how much does it disturb your view and what are the tips and tricks how to play around? Um, you obviously, the, the important thing is to do a baseline grayscale scan first of all, because then you get an idea, and, and don't forget, you, you're concentrating on a fairly small space in a child. You know, it's not a, it's not like the adult, it's not like scanning the abdomen where you have a much bigger, bigger volume to get through. So always do your grayscale image first and get an idea of what, the, what gas is there. I tend to find that it doesn't interfere with the, with the contrast bubbles at all. Um, and certainly that is why we will often combine an, an intravenous um, injection first. So you can look at the collapsed lung. You can get that out the way. You know where your plane is of collapsed lungs. You know the necrotizing pneumonia is out the picture before you start to look at the uh, pleural space. Okay. And uh, would you go for more routine use of contrast ultrasound to differentiate atelectasis from pneumonia? or not really uh no i think it depends very much on the clinicians um and what uh, we we tend to use this really in our complex pneumonia cases you know a lot of you'll see a lot of children in the winter with pneumonia a lot of children with atelectasis you don't necessarily the same they don't all go on to develop an empyema they don't all have pleural effusions so we mostly um use this in our complex um, pneumonias, our complex um, empyemas. A lot of the children will get treated, usually as outpatients, you know, they'll come in, have some changes on an x-ray and be sent home with oral antibiotics. We preserve these investigations really for the complex inpatients where they're struggling to manage them and struggling to treat them. Would you find there would be also a solution, not only for pediatric population, but maybe you or your colleagues have tried it for adults and their complicated pneumonias, uh, destructive pneumonias and other those complicated cases. Would we use it? Maybe we should use it more than we do. Um, difficult to speak for adult practice. Um, 
I think there you you need to a lot of our a lot of our certainly in the pediatric practice that I work in a lot of my examinations are driven by the clinicians so it's it's a practice that we've developed over the years so in fact my clinicians will ask for the investigation I won't necessarily go and seek out that group of patients so I certainly think yes it can be used in the adult adult patients you probably will be inundated with more um, more patients to scan because I think there are, are naturally a bigger population group, particularly your very sick patients on ITUs. But I certainly think it, it, it can be used to um, steer um, the clinicians in terms of what needs draining, what doesn't need draining, or in fact, does this patient rather require a cardiothoracic input and in fact need surgical decortica decortication of a, of a pleural um, uh, empyema. You may be able to get to that answer more quickly um, with contrast ultrasound rather than waiting a week or 10 days before you actually make that decision on, on a clinical basis. I asked you this question because we have from audience the question about uh, the category called big children. It's right. very relative, yeah, <laughs> what we call big child. But uh, sometimes, yes, the children at the age of 16, 18 are in the size and also the physical appearance is very comparable to the adults. So is there any difference in the amounts that you use maybe? No, no, not at all. I mean, you know, as I say, in, 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 a, in, in terms of the volume of contrast, we, we do, once you've got your answer, you stop injecting. It's not like an IV where you give a, a, a set dose of 2.4 mils or a set dose of, of 1.2 mils or, or, or 0.6 mils, you know, depending on the size of the child. You, you can get your answer within five, six mLs of, of injection. And, and you obviously don't want to go and inject a 20 mL or 50 mL syringe because that, that really is just going to cause more discomfort for the patient. And, and certainly we've never had to do that before you can get an answer. Um, you get your answer pretty quickly, actually. There's a very sophisticated question about cystic fibrosis. You have right. any experience of uh, injection? intravenously an assessment of this disease uh no i haven't to be honest we've only as i say we've only used it in 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 our, our pneumonia patients but certainly it, it it may well be something we can look at in the future we have a big population of children here uh with cystic fibrosis um and they are managed by the uh pediatric uh, chest physicians who do a lot of probably more invasive procedures like bronchoscopy, et cetera. So yes, that is probably something we could we could extend our practice to, but currently, no, we don't. And I, I have no personal experience of it, I'm afraid. As long as we are in the thorax, I uh, have the personal question to you about the connection of the uh, esophagus and uh, maybe some uh, bronchopleural uh, connection with the uh, digestive system. Would you be challenged by such a cases uh, because contrast, ultrasound, and ultrasound provides you real time? It maybe, provides it's, it, it, it maybe we could try to look for those fistulas, bronchoesophageal or esophageal plural. So what, what is your opinion? Would there be a role for them? Um, I think the difficulty there is going to be you've got a child with an aerated lung and aerated lung is going to get in the way with ultrasound with contrast as it does with grayscale. Um, I think that would oh, that would be the only limiting step is that would you be able to see through aerated lung in order to find the fistulas? Um, I think that that probably would be would be the problem. But I think it's you know if you've got a child and they're stable, it's worth trying um again you're running the difficulty of injecting fluid um certainly with a with a tracheosophageal fistula you know you're injecting fluid potentially Ooh, into the lung and and you're not quite sure what it's going to do so you know i think that's always you have think you've got to be slightly careful there yeah all right and the last question in this session is um going more also to the mediastinum do you okay. have any experience in uh, contrast ultrasound and those mediastinal masses? Uh, would you inject, you go around the thorax, maybe you have detected something? Um, no, we haven't. Uh, we, m most of our, our 
cardi we don't do pediatric cardiothoracics here, unfortunately, so I don't have a cohort of patients um, to do that. But I imagine you probably could. I don't see why not. If you, you know, we scan small infants, we ultrasound their mediastinums, looking at the thymus. So I don't see why you couldn't look at a child with a, you know, with an anterior mediastinal mass with contrast ultrasound. I think it is possible. Um, but as I say, we don't have that cohort of patients here. Um, so yeah, I, I have no experience with that, I'm afraid. But I think it is doable. I think it is doable. Okay, thank you. And thanks again uh, for a very comprehensive uh, talk, not only about uh, lungs, also about the pleural space and uh, new possibilities where we can still explore uh, the contrast ultrasound benefits and especially in the children population and I think that it's very important to note once more that now it is uh, officially uh, FDA approved at least one of the first indications in children officially in the liver but we hope for some more officially uh, noted indications in uh, uh, worldwide use of this modality. I thank all the participants for their active questions and active participation.